Well, hello, everyone. I have the honor of uh, introducing the Michael J. Wargo Exploration Science Award this morning. This award is an annual award given to a scientist or engineer who has significantly contributed to the integration of exploration and planetary science throughout their career. Dr. Michael J. Wargo was chief exploration scientist for NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, as well as the predecessors of that, and was a strong advocate for the integration of science, engineering, and technology. He was a good friend of NLSI, helped create us, and, and of uh, Servi, and a dear friend of uh, many of us uh, in this room, including myself. The winner of the 2018 Michael J. Wargo Exploration Science Award is David Kring this year, who has been a leading light in integrating exploration and planetary science. Dr. Kring's research explores the origin of the solar nebula and its evolution into a geologically active planetary system, the geologic history of the Earth, Moon, Mars, and several smaller planetary bodies, impact cratering on the Earth, its effect on Earth's environment, and its possible role in the biological evolution of our planet, and the chemical and physical properties of meteorites. He's currently integrating his field experience in impact cratered terrains with his analytical experience of Apollo, Luna, and lunar meteorite sample collections from the moon to lead the development of spacecraft missions in response to the President's Lunar Exploration Initiative. David is a senior scientist at LPI. His career is uh, bookended at uh, LPI. He started his career actually as an intern there as well, and he's held various positions, including some at the uh, University of Arizona. Please join me in congratulating David, uh, the winner of the Wargo Award, for all he's done to prepare us for a return to the moon. Okay, um, thank you very much, Greg, Yvonne. Um, I want to start with a couple of slides of appreciation. Um, first, of course, um, I want to thank Adele and all of Mike's family. Um, they've supported this award since it was initiated. Um, I want to thank Survey Central, NASA headquarters, and the colleagues in the community, uh, some of which are sitting in, in the room. For those of you who don't know, um, Mike and Wargo and I actually, um, at some level, grew up in the same town, at least intellectually. Uh, he went to MIT, I went to Harvard, and you can imagine there was a little bantering between us <laughs> over the years. Um, I first met Mike really during the Constellation program, however. Uh, he pulled me into a number of uh, committees. We evalu evaluated crew health issues, lunar surface EVA issues, try to determine what the best mobility assets would be, whether we should have sortie missions or outpost missions, and, and so on and so forth. And throughout that process, he had one of these infectious, enthusiastic demeanors. Um, he was very excited about um, the opportunities below, uh, beyond low Earth orbit, and that, in fact, just bled over into everything that uh, we were doing. Okay, I also want to take a moment, though, to, to thank everybody who's participated in the LPI JSC Center for Lunar Science and Exploration, which is something that the LPI and the JSC allowed me to, to uh, found about 10 years ago. I have a long list of all the people who have been involved in this. Over 60 scientists, plus over 20 instructors at 
collaborating uh, universities, 21 postdoctoral researchers, including three uh, at the moment, Katie Robinson, Martin Schmieder, and, and Timmons Erickson. We've had a large number of students, and there's this group of students here towards the end. 74 graduate students have conducted lunar landing site studies and traverses, and importantly, also, since we are hopefully going to be doing lunar surface operations, we've had over 170 graduate students participate in uh, training in analog terrain such as Meteor Crater, the Sudbury Crater, and the San Francisco Volcanic Field. And we've also had the good fortune of training a majority of the flight active astronauts, which I think is going to be very important. Um, I've all been encouraging them to review some of the lunar-related notes that I gave them over the past few years because I'm hoping they'll be on the lunar surface soon. Uh, so uh, with that said, I, I mean, I know this award is, is uh, given to me, but I really do want to accept it on behalf of, of all of these people because they've made our science and exploration program uh, possible. Okay, now, um, in these types of presentations, you can reminisce. Uh, or you can look forward. And I'm going to choose to look forward. And what I would like to do is start with this slide that I showed you on Tuesday when we were discussing the transformative lunar science uh, paper. Uh, these are the five simple me messages that I tried to leave you with, and I would like to expand a few of them to give you a sense of what I'm, I'm thinking. And so the first one there is explore the unexplore, go to the lunar far side and poles. And one of the reasons is this chart that I tried to describe on Tuesday. There have been, to date, 27 missions to the surface on the lunar near side, and there have been zero on the far side. And so my argument is, if you're going to explore, we should be exploring the unexplored. I also said the poles, and the reason I think that we also want to go to the poles is, is shown here. In the uh, far uh, left, you can see the near side distribution of the Apollo uh, landing sites. On the far right, you see the empty far side that I just argued needs to be explored. And you can see that the situation around the North Pole and the South Pole is similarly vacant of lunar surface activities. And so I think we really do want to, as I said, explore the unexplored. Okay. I don't want to say that we shouldn't go to the near side. That would be silly. I actually would be thrilled to study uh, Copernicus or Tycho or Aristarchus. But my warning is we don't want to get trapped on the near side. We want to make sure the architecture supports global access. And when making strategic decisions, we don't want to lose sight of the priorities uh, that are articulated in the scientific context for exploration of the moon, of whom Barb and Carly Peters had a big hand in uh, crafting. Um, so, then the question is, where to land and explore? Uh, really, the entire lunar surface should be open to our exploration. If we do use that uh, guideline, the scientific context for the exploration of the moon, you can go through their prioritized assessment of objectives, and you can produce a global learning landing site study report, which we've done here. And if you do that, uh, what you find is that the Schrodinger Basin, which is within the South Pole Aiken Basin on the far side, is one of the highest priority landing sites simply because you can do so much science and address several key exploration issues in a single site. And so for that reason, it has been used as a trade study for a lot of the uh, architectural units, both within uh, the NASA agency, within other uh, uh, international space agencies, and some of our um, industry partners, such as Lockheed uh, Martin. And that's allowed us to probe what these missions might look like if we go to the moon. And so we have conducted communication studies uh, uh, for missions to the Schrodinger Basin. We've been able to put, to get, put together integrated mission timelines. We've designed landing sites and uh, uh, conducted traverse trades. And all of this um, can produce some incredibly exciting science while also assessing some of the ISR potential of an expanded lunar exploration campaign. Okay, so let's go to the second bullet. Uh, the second simple message, leadership begins with meaningful missions, land on the lunar surface. And I guess I'd like to expand on that a little bit by taking a lesson from history. Ashkan, if you can start this video, whoops, 
This is some words from President Kennedy before why Apollo. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. So I want to pull out a key phrase. We want to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. If your argument for not going to the far side is because it's harder, I don't buy it. That's not where we should be going. Okay. The initiative uh, that Kennedy, President Kennedy launched contains a powerful lesson that we should not forget. He didn't say just launch big rockets. He instead gave the nation a meaningful destination, the lunar surface, with meaningful objectives. And so I would argue as we move forward today with a new lunar exploration campaign, let's not get trapped at a point in space. Let's not get trapped in lunar orbit. Let's make sure that we land on the surface for long-term exploration and utilization as stipulated in Space Policy Directive 1. Okay, another point that I was trying to make on Tuesday is to truly make transformative scientific discoveries, we need sample return missions to high priority landing sites. Uh, Barb uh, articulated the same message a few moments ago, and I'm not going to walk you through uh, the argument for this. I simply, because we've, we've stated it in the Transformative Lunar Science White Paper and we discussed it on Tuesday, but I do want to just enunciate that by stating that the moon is the best and the most accessible location in the solar system to address fundamental questions about our origins and a life-sustaining planetary system. That takes us to the next simple message that is an integrated robotic and human exploration program with international and commercial partners will produce the greatest science. This first point is important. It's always critical that we remember the best results will be obtained by a well-trained crew on the lunar surface. Yes, we're gonna have robotic missions. We're gonna have an integrated robotic and human exploration program. But again, we don't wanna design an architecture that neglects or forgets about the capability of our astronauts. Fortunately, prototype hardware to support that effort has already been developed, and I just want to give you a couple of examples. That is this lunar electric rover, which you've heard me speak about before. A generation one crew vehicle has been tested in the field in a series of three 14 and 28 day mission simulations. These tests include over 1,000 hours of astronaut time in the vehicle, and nearly 3,000 hours of total crew time in high fidelity uh, simulations. I like to think of this vehicle as a geological tool. It has mobility, visibility, gives you accessible, uh, makes the surface accessible, allows you to document the surface, and once a crew goes EVA, you can collect samples. When the vehicle was built, I was actually asked to go through an area and do the field geology in just shirt sleeves I then was put in the vehicle to see how much of that geology I could do with, from within the vehicle, and we found that I could do 90% of the geology in the vehicle that I could walking along the ground myself. The only thing I really couldn't do was collect samples, and that was easy to do because in this vehicle, you can egress to the lunar surface in about 10 minutes. We learned that crew producti productivity is much greater in this lunar electric rover, this small pressurized rover, uh, with suit ports than in an unpressurized rover that forces the astronauts to wear suits all day, as we did with the Apollo uh, astronauts. We learned that suit parts, ports are far more efficient than an airlock and greatly enhances crew productivity. And that actually isn't just me speaking as a geologist, that was actually measured by the human performance uh, scientists within NASA. We also learned that suit ports keep lunar dust out of the crew habitation volume, which minimizes the dust hazard that uh, has generated fear in some people's analyses. 
And finally, we learned that continuous communication with Earth is more productive than twice a day communication, which really does uh, illustrate the need for a strong uh, communication uh, asset or series of assets that provide communication to all points on the lunar surface, and in particular, uh, the far side. Okay, so continuing that same theme, uh, we have a fantastic rover, but what is still missing is a human-rated lander. We can't forget that. That definitely needs to be uh, initiated sooner rather than later. But while that is being done, it is uh, very true that we can uh, make significant progress with robotic and integrated robotic and human exploration programs, such as depositing a robotic asset on the far side and it being teleoperated from the Orion vehicle or gateway, as was described by Terry Fong and Jack Burns earlier in the week. This is the same type of plan that's currently being investigated in the equivalent of a phase A study by ESA, the Canadian Space Agency, and JAXA, as, uh, and is known as the uh, Heracles concept. Those are the tools that will let us address a lot of big ideas, and these are the ideas that I introduced on Tuesday. Um, if we actually develop and fly those vehicles, the human exploration effort is going to catapult planetary science into a completely new state of knowledge. I don't think there's any doubt that that will actually uh, happen. So I have some final thoughts, and then I'm going to show you a video. We know everything we need to land immediately. We don't need precursor missions to human landings. We can fly robotic missions to learn new things, but they're not required to send crew back to the lunar surface tomorrow. We should not allow the effort to get stalled again by an unending series of studies. And once an architecture has been selected, I please ask everybody to rally behind it and fly. We don't want to have happen this time what has happened twice before. And we need to develop a culture that demands and thrives on a menu of constant flight opportunities. I ask or say that it's time to go, and the sooner uh, the better. Okay. Uh, those are all the remarks I have, but I do want to close with a film. Uh, this is a film that some of you have seen before. It's about two and a half minutes long. And the reason I've dusted this off and want to show it to you again is one, I just find it inspirational. Um, but also because uh, I'm being recognized uh, uh, with the Wargo Award. And this film utilizes some of the first LRO data that was produced. This is the mission that Mike Wargo uh, had near and dear to his heart. Uh, we had to produce this film taking uh, LROC images and drape them over uh, Lola topography to create realistic scenes with this real data of the lunar surface. Um, in a couple of places, too, we have quite intentionally juxtaposed this new LRO data with some of the older Apollo and lunar orbiter data so that you can see how far we have come and hopefully really be convinced that we know everything we need to know to return to the moon tomorrow. Ashkan, if you can run the film.
Thank you again.